All right, so we're going to pick off, pick up where we left off with, at the end of last time, looking at our optimized mesh. And I have a few things we want to go over in this uh, particular video. It's going to be plasticity in a plate with a hole, but there's a lot of things, interesting things we can do now. And I want to uh, kind of go over some of these things. So I'm going to call up my notepad. We're going to do elastic plastic analysis. We want to talk a little bit about nonlinearity versus linearity for an analysis and what that means. We're going to work with stress strain curves a little bit. We're going to use time histories of load and get time histories of output. We're going to take a look at some visualization options, including creating some charts, some animations, and saving the animations, saving some images. We're going to talk about the different hardening rules of plasticity that are available. We're going to talk mainly about isotropic and kinematic hardening. We're going to use isotropic hardening in this example, but we need to understand what some of the limitations are of isotropic and kinematic hardening, and then uh, some of the more advanced options of dealing with cyclic plasticity and abacus. We'll just kind of touch on that. We're going to talk about something called Neuber's rule for notch analysis. Neuber's rule is something that we would talk about in uh, my fatigue analysis class and, and probably my plasticity class in a little bit more detail. But we're going to touch on that since we have a, a nice example to illustrate Neuber's rule with. And then we're going to see that we're going to get some error messages and kind of how to interpret those and get around those and understand where they're coming from. So let's go back uh, to my CAE file. I've started it up. I've loaded up my previous file. Now before I started this video I tried a few options just to make sure everything was working okay. And uh, so I have that, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to my optimized plate that I had, and I'm just going to copy this model. Okay, and I'm going to call this optimized plate um, plasticity two. So I'm just starting with my original uh, from the end of last time, the end of my optimized plate. So if you remember last time when we had our plate with a hole, we decided we wanted to have a quarter symmetric model. Where we put just enough load on here as a pressure to give me one megapascal nominal stress. And our calculation said that we needed a minus 0 0.8 megapascal pressure up on top. Now the minus reverses the sign so that the pressure looks like a tensile stress. For some reason, tension just looks, uh, I'm just more comfortable with tension. There's no reason why it couldn't be compression in this as well. But we're going to use uh, tension with a 1 megapascal nominal stress. But we're going to increase this load until we have plasticity in and see what we what happens. And if you remember our stress concentration factor for this was around 2.5. You know, I, I don't remember the exact number from last time, but for our optimized mesh it was something like 2.52 or 2.51, somewhere in there. So we'll we'll have to do a little bit of calculations to make sure that we have plasticity at the notch, but we don't want so much plasticity that we have what's called neck net section plasticity. Um, that'll be part of the error message that we're going to have to interpret. We'll, we'll do that and see what happens. We're going to use Excel a little bit. Maybe I should put that on here. You don't have to use Excel. But uh, I find it kind of handy. Sometimes it's easier to manipulate some of the plots and data in Excel than it is directly in, in Abacus. So let's see. Let's talk about linearity versus nonlinearity. Let me save this file and I'll bring up a, a clean page. All right, so let's talk about linearity. A lot of nice things happen when we know things are linear. And there are basically two types of linearity that we need to be concerned about at the present time. One is material nonlinearity. The other is geometric nonlinearity.
Now there's a couple ways that we can discuss this. First of all, the material nonlinearity. Obviously, if we have a <clears throat> linear elastic material, we have a straight line on a stress strain curve. And if it's an isotropic material, we can call that the modulus of elasticity E. And if we have a nonlinear material, then maybe uh, we have a little bit of yielding of the material. And we have our stress versus strain curve that looks like this. It can be a nonlinear elastic material as well. And uh, that would be a nonlinearity issue too. Now, geometric nonlinearity, if you could imagine maybe uh, a column, if we were to apply some load on this column, then this column pretty much stays straight up into a certain load. And after a certain load, this column may suddenly really buckle and move way out of position. If it's a large deflection or large deformation, we can introduce some geometric nonlinearities. Well, what makes something a large deformation? Well, a large deformation will interfere with our assumptions for small deformation and small strain analysis. And that's kind of a roundabout way to, to define that, but if it makes a difference, then you should consider uh, geometric nonlinearity. If it doesn't make a difference, then you don't have to worry about it. So it's one of those things where you may have to check both cases, or unless you have some experience with uh, geometric nonlinearities and the magnitudes that are involved, or some insight into the equations and the assumptions of basic uh, small deformation theory elasticity, then uh, you may have to check both cases. So those are the two different types of um, nonlinearity that we're going to initially be concerned with. And for now, we're not really going to worry too much about the geometric nonlinearity, but concentrate on the material nonlinearity. <clears throat> the advantage of a linear problem is that everything scales. If you have a linear elastic finite element analysis, if we were to have our plate with our hole, and we were to apply 0.8 megapascals on top and get a stress right here of 2.51. If we were to double that load to be 1.6, I'm saying minus 1.6 pressure. That's why the negative sign is in there. If we were to double that load, then the stress right here would be what, uh, 5.02 megapascals. If our problem is nonlinear, we can no longer make that assumption. That just won't be true. And if the whole problem is linear elastic, it's not just this point at the corner of this hole, the edge right here. It's anywhere in this finite element mesh, you'll have a scaled up stress response with the applied loads. So in linear problems, stresses scale directly with applied loads. If we decided we wanted to put a stress in the x direction of this plate, we could do linear superposition. We could have a unit stress in the x direction and a unit stress in the vertical direction. And we can scale the appropriate stress fields and add them together. So that's where superposition applies. Right, so. If you're going to do a linear elastic finite element analysis, um, you really have a lot more than you might think of at first. It's not just that single load. Some of you saw this on your first homework assignment. If you doubled the load, you got double the stress and double the displacement, and everything just scales with that load. All right, so linearity versus nonlinearity. 
let's talk a little bit about how we're going to get our stress strain curve into Abacus. Right, so we're going to look at material nonlinearity and we're going to use a real material that I've tested down in the lab. It's called P91 steel. It's grade 91 steel. It's used in uh, steam powered power plants. So if you have a hot steam pipe then uh, this is a material that it may be made out of. Now I'm going to give you this spreadsheet and there's a lot of information in the spreadsheet but I want to give you a complete one. So let's just review what it is. So this first tab is P91 with SI units. Now it's SI units for the stress strain curve but the testing units were in pounds and inches. So here's time in seconds, here's axial force, axial displacement, that's the movement of the testing machine piston, here's the total strain and the mechanical strain. Now this was done at room temperature so it's an isothermal test. Now the temperature did change maybe a degree or two during the test so this thermal strain reading uh, did change a little bit but we're going to ignore the thermal strain. It's uh, a very small number and it's constant and it wasn't zeroed out before we started uh, so we can safely ignore that. <clears throat> here's the diameter of the bar, here's the area and I went ahead and calculated the modulus of elasticity for this material and it's about 215 megapascals. Uh, 215 times 10 to the 3 megapascals, 215 gigapascals. So here's the stress in megapascals and on this axis is the strain and it's a unit that you may not have seen before, it's called percent strain. Basically percent strain is uh, the strain times 100. There's my cursor. So let's go down a little bit and I'll show you a couple more things. So in this I analyzed the modulus of elasticity. That's how I got the 215 number. Yeah, I did a linear fit on the initial part of the stress strain curve. And here I got a proportional limit stress and a 0.2% offset yield stress of 414 megapascals and 510 megapascals respectively. Now we'll keep these numbers in mind, 414 and 510. What we're going to put into Abacus is going to be different than those numbers and we want to explain why that difference is. Our initial yield stress for Abacus will be the place where we want to say there is zero plastic strain or approximately zero plastic strain. So like I said I'll give you this directly. Uh, let's see, probably one more plot I want to show you. It will be this one right here. This is the stress versus the displacement of the piston and it was a dog bone specimen so it's not a you're not going to use be able to use this as a stress strain curve but what I wanted to show was that the ultimate stress was around here uh, somewhere around it looks like a 660 megapascals but there's this little dip right here uh, maybe around 630 yeah, 633 megapascals that little dip in load was when I took the extensometer off of my specimen extensometer measures strain when I took the extensometer off the load relaxed just a little bit because it was in displacement control. So I get a little uh, bump downward but then when the displacement was continued on that load picked right back up and it joined the rest of this curve. Now I don't have any strain data beyond the point where I took off the extensometer so our stress strain curve is going to be truncated right at this spot and that's where it stops here at about 633, uh, 635 megapascals. But we still get close to four and a half, five percent strain. Now that is the total strain. Let's talk about plastic strain and total strain. When we have a uniaxial test, I'm just drawing the gauge section right here, we put a load on this and we get stress and we get strain and we know that if we're in the elastic range that our stress and our strain are related through Hooke's Law.
or less than the proportional limit. And a lot of times it's pretty close to the yield stress of a material. But if we go into the plastic range of the material, we no longer have this relationship apply for the total strain. What we say that the total strain is composed of an elastic strain and a plastic strain. Let me sketch a stress strain curve. So for a metal that has a linear elastic behavior up until the yields or proportional limit, it continues on this curvy part. And when this material gets unloaded, it follows an unloading line that is parallel to the initial portion of the stress strain curve. Since it's yielded, we have some permanent deformation. And this is represented by this part that would be the plastic strain that's left over when that material is unloaded, the plastic or permanent strain. That means when I was up here at this strain level, if I take this and run this line straight down, this represents my total strain. And this part of the strain that's right here that is what is known as recovered was the elastic strain that I had up at this point. So if I want, I can rearrange this a little bit and I can say that any place along my stress strain curve, the value of the plastic strain is the value of the total strain minus the elastic strain. Now since the elastic strains are related to Hooke's law through the stresses by this equation, I can say that the plastic strain is equal to the total strain minus the stress level divided by E. Again, we have to have a uniaxial state of stress to be able to make this kind of analysis. If you have a multiaxial state of stress, you can do something similar, but the equations become a little bit more involved. All right, so let's go back to my stress strain curve on that graph. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this curve and I'm going to subtract away the elastic strains. And so a couple of columns here, get everything in order. I went from percent strain to regular strain in millimeter per millimeter. And this column right here is the stress, excuse me, is the total strain minus the stress divided by my modulus of elasticity that I had found, my 215 gigapascals. So I made another column, and here it says selected points for use in abacus. Here's my graph of all the points. This is the blue curve right here. And let me turn off, um, let me make a copy of this. Let me turn off one of these plots. So here's the curvy part. Now this isn't percent strain anymore, but on this axis is the plastic strain. And again, this is the stress. And it looks like, you know, we might have to zoom in on it. Let's change the axis value to maybe 0.01. It looks like somewhere around 400 megapascals. Here I say uh, 388. What it's looking like is where it starts to leave the vertical axis. Now I do have plastic strains uh, all over. Now if you go down here to a, a stress level 159 megapascals, I have a plastic strain of about 2 microstrain. Some of these numbers flip back and forth from positive or negative, uh, and that's just because of uh, the kind of the coarseness of my uh, strain measurements, if you will. But what I've done is I've selected several points along this curve. Just by using my cursor, I go over here, here's 413, maybe here's uh, 451, here's 481. And I selected several points, and I plotted those on this plot that are discrete points along this curve. 
my experience with Abacus is that you don't want like 200 of these points in your material property definition. You want maybe uh, 10 or 15. Whatever defines this curve fairly well. If there's a straight line segment between the stress versus plastic strain, just use the two points on the either end of the segment. So you notice right here I have several points to get this curvy part and then my points are kind of spaced more more further apart along the strain axis since it's kind of a straight line between each of these different segments. When I went through and did this and I copied and pasted these lines down and if you notice here this one is about 76.5 micro strain but there's one thing you need to know about abacus and inputting the stress strain curve in the plastic region is that the first value of plastic strain has to be zero. So here I have 436.5 megapascals and I change this number right here to zero. And if I look at my plot, it still doesn't look too bad. I mean, I didn't zoom in on this one, but I don't think that looks like it's too bad of a, a plot. So I will give this data to you and what we're going to do is we're going to copy and we're going to paste this into our material definition. We'll keep that highlighted for now. We'll get back to that. Okay, so there's a little bit of information there about plasticity uh, and a uniaxial stress strain test. So let's go back to our abacus file. And we're going to go in here and we're going to go to our material definition. And we had our modulus of elasticity is 210. Now for this material, it's just a little bit stiffer, so let's use 215, and we're still going to use Poisson's ratio of 0.3. So that's our elastic material behavior, but we're going to add something to it. We're going to use uh, the plasticity option under mechanical, and you notice there's a lot of different options. Plastic, cap plasticity, cast iron plasticity, uh, concrete, smeared, cracking, all these different things, crushable foam. If you have interest in some of these others, I would encourage you to look in the manual and read all about those different options. All right. we'll, we'll get to some of these things uh, as we uh, go through the class, but we're not going to be able to get to all of them. So we're going to choose this plastic option, and here it has an option right here for what's called hardening. For now, I want you to leave this as isotropic hardening. But if you select this drop down, there's isotropic, kinematic, Johnson Cook, user defined, and combined. We'll talk about some of these options. Like I said, for right now, uh, we're going to choose isotropic hardening. This is not the same thing as an isotropic material, a material that behaves the same in all directions. That's different. This means something very different. And if you have a class in plasticity, and I do teach that as well, I think I have a couple of videos up on uh, YouTube too on uh, isotropic versus kinematic hardening. But that's something that you would get into in detail in uh, a plasticity class. Now there are also some sub-options. We can use strain rate dependent data. We can use temperature dependent data. If we select this option, then we can specify yield stress and plastic strain at various temperatures and we have other options and we have additional sub options cyclic hardening or now plasticity annealing temperatures all these things we're just going to use this default but what we're going to do is we're going to go back to our excel file let me drag this over here i'm going to highlight this i'm going to right click and i'm going to go copy i'm going to put this in here and i'm going to go paste it's going to paste these values right in. Okay. And again, it's very important that we have uh, zero for our initial value. So this will be our abacus yield stress. That may not really be your real material yield stress from a 0.2% offset. This will be our yield stress that we're going to use associated with zero plastic strain. Is it going to be off a little bit? Well, yeah, it's about 76 microstrains off, but that's going to be okay. Uh, you know, you can make things more precisely if you if you would like. If you notice, our values stop around 336 megapascals, where we have this value of plastic strain. Uh, 
about 4%, it looks like. Beyond that value of, of plastic strain, beyond that value of stress, rather, uh, isotropic hardening assumes that we have a perfectly flat stress-strain curve. Let's go back to our stress-strain picture. So beyond this value, it's like this curve is just completely horizontal after this point. Now there may be issues that come up with that type of material behavior, and we'll run into one as we test out our analysis. So we have that material in here, and now I'm going to hit OK. Let's review our steps. We have our initial boundary conditions where we have symmetry conditions on the, the left side and on the bottom. And uh, in our step one, we have a load that's in tension on the top. And let's look at that panel again. Oops. It's a uniformly distributed load that can be changed as a function of position if we want to create an analytical field. And that's what that means. We can have something higher over here and lower over there if we'd like. And it has this magnitude of minus 0.8. Again, the minus sign represents uh, something that's in tension for a pressure load. And it says the amplitude is a ramp. And so we previously ramped over one second from zero time to one second of time from our zero load to our maximum load value. But what we're going to do is we're going we're to create an amplitude. So I'm going to go over here where this little sine wave symbol is at, and I'm going to click on it, and it comes up with all these different options. Tabular, equally spaced in time, periodic, modulated, some of these things uh, uh, I've used, some of them I've never used. Actuator, spectrum, user defined, PSD definition. If you need to know what those are, take a look in the uh, manual, or I think we can probably do a context based help. If you come up here with this arrow and the question mark, maybe uh, let's try this. Let's see what uh, modulated means. It comes up with a uh, the the manual, and it tells us what. Uh, modulated means. Talks about amplitude curves. So you can read up about it. The context sensitive help is fairly convenient. All right. We're going to do a tabular and we're just going to leave this as amp1. In the time span is it says step time. That's fine. So this will be the time in the step. We can change this to total time if we would like. Now we're going to use uh, user default smoothing, uh, solver default smoothing. And here, here's uh, time and amplitude. Now, before we put in our times and our amplitudes, let's talk about what Abacus is going to do with this since we have a minus 0.8 right here. Okay, so let's look at this magnitude right here. I'm going to keep that in mind. The load that's going to be applied to our model is going to be our magnitude. That's described on our load card or, or panel. Times the amplitude in our amplitude function. All right, so if I wanted to apply, well if I take my minus 0.8, which is my magnitude, and I apply uh, 100 megapascals in my amplitude card, the load that I'm really applying to the top edge of that plate is going to be minus 80. So keep that in mind. Amplitude card multiplied by that magnitude on that panel gives us our total load that's applied in that particular time step. Now 
here's time and amplitude. I have another Excel file, and this is one you'll probably want to make up uh, yourself. But what we're going to do, uh, what I have here, is I just picked out some times from 0 to 10 seconds, and here's my amplitude from 0 to 1,000 megapascals. Now, 1,000 megapascals applied to the top edge of my plate times minus 0 0.8, that's 800 um, megapascals, that exceeds the level of uh, our stress strain curve that we've defined. We can't apply that much stress. It just won't work, but, but let's uh, see what happens and I'll show you how to interpret that error. So I'm going to copy that and then I'm going to paste it in here. And a shortcut, if you do, if you highlight it, hit Control C, come over here and hit Control V. And it'll paste it in there. So here's the time and here's our amplitude. I'm going to hit OK for that. And uh, now I need to open up this step. Remember, we only had one second, but now we have 10 seconds of amplitude. So I'm going to change this to 10. I also need to check my incrementation now at this point. If it takes several increments to, to calculate uh, the plastic strains, we may end up with more increments needed than what we have specified in this panel. I always like to just add a couple zeros here. Uh, hopefully it won't take that many, but we'll see how many increments it does take. This will be the maximum. If we exceed the maximum increments, the analysis will stop. So I'm going to hit OK on this. And then the last thing I need to change is this field output request. Now right now we said we just wanted it the uh, every in increments, which basically means at the end of the step. But I'm going to change this so we have every x units of time, and we have 10 seconds. I want an output at every 0.1 second of time. And you can change this to output at exact times or approximate times. I'm going to leave it at exact. It's going to make it work a little bit harder, but, but that'll be all right. And I'm going to leave this as uh, what we had last time for our pre-selected defaults. If there are other things that we need, we can ask them to be output uh, in this panel right here. And then I'm going to hit OK for this. All right, now I think I have everything we need. Um, there's always a chance that I've forgotten something, and we'll have to go back and fix it. I'm going to come down here, and I am going to I'm going to delete this job. Now, it doesn't mean it deletes the files, but I just want to delete that job. I'm going to create a new job one, and the source is going to be from this optimized plate plasticity dash two. We can type in a description if we want. And then when we're ready, I'm going to right-click and hit Submit. Ask me if I'm going to override. I'm going to say OK. Right, so the job has been submitted. This one we'll find is probably going to take a little bit longer time. So what we're going to do here is I want to show you how to monitor the results. I'm going to right-click. I'm going to go to Monitor. It has a lot of iterations already. Okay, but it's uh, marching on through. And it says it has completed. Uh, now let's see uh, what it's done here. I think it should have crashed, but uh, I might have made a mistake. Let's right click and go to uh, results. Okay, that was a, a previous analysis. Let me close that output database. All right. <clears throat> so let's take a look at our results. And in fact, I don't have quite what I want yet. And I'll show you how I can tell. So up on the top, it has these primary variables. <clears throat> S is for stress, and this is a von Mises stress. We still need to explain that, but uh, what we're going to do is we're going to change this to PE, which stands for plastic strain. And this is the plastic strains. If I animate this and it goes through time, see it's stepping through. We can speed this up a little bit. 
we're not getting any plastic strains at all. So something must have happened to get this a little bit messed up in our analysis. We didn't get what we wanted. Sometimes these mistakes are good to make, so uh, I can show you what to look for. So let me uh, pause this. I'm going to go back to my model, and we're going to take a look and make sure we have the loads applied that we think we have. We made this amplitude. Okay, and here we have these big numbers in the amplitude. But let's go back in our load card, our load area. And you notice, even though we created an amplitude, I forgot to specify this as that amplitude 1. Okay. So now I'm going to right click and I'm going to submit this. I'm going to overwrite those files. And uh, now we should get something that looks a little more interesting as far as these results go. So we're going to monitor this. Uh, these also are created in uh, on our temp folder. If we go into uh, temp, here it is, uh, job one. If we sort this by name, Okay. You see some temporary files. That's a good sign. The lock file means that it won't let the operating system overwrite your files. Uh, 023 and these SMA files are temporary files. That'll go away. And uh, here's a log file. We can even open this up in the text editor. It's running Abacus Standard. In the MSG file and the STA file are some things that we can monitor within Abacus itself by doing this monitor option. So it's still running. You notice that we've, we're starting to get some plasticity. It's taking a, a few increments. Here we're at increment 485. Here's our time. See how the time is getting smaller in between these increments. This is having to do equilibrium iterations. Initially these increments were pretty big. Slowing down a little bit, we can see if there's any errors yet or any warning. Okay, now here's some warnings. The strain increment has exceeded 50 times the strain that caused first yield at 95 points, and that is, is going. Okay, the strain limit, uh, the message limit has reached. No further warning messages will be reported. See the data file for more warnings, and we can do that as well. So it's taking a few seconds. The message file and the status file give more information. And we'll just let that run until it, uh, it can't do it. I'll pause this here. It's taking a few minutes. And finally, it says uh, the job has been aborted. It's aborted with an error. Now, let's take a look on a data file and see what the error is. If we want to search, we can go in here and look for error. Analysis complete with two errors on the message file and two warning messages on the dat file. Okay, so let's take a look at the, the message file. We'll scroll all the way down to the bottom. Look for error. The time increment required is less than the minimum specified. The analysis has been terminated due to previous errors. All output requests have been written for the last converged increment. All right, so look at this. This time uh, increment went all the way down to 1 times 10 to the minus 35. Now, we can change the time increment minimum if we go and open this step. If we look at the incrementation, see this number right here can be changed. But 1 times 10 to the minus 35 is such a tiny number. This really indicates we have some other problem in our analysis. There is some data in our data file, though. So let's open it up and let's take a look. And I think we'll understand what the issue is. So we're going to right click and go to results. Okay, this is the Mimesis stress. Let's change it to plastic strain. And let's animate this 
and uh, see what we we get. So initially there's no plastic strain whatsoever. And these numbers are pretty big. Uh, these are huge strains. Let's go ahead and fast forward to the end. Okay, it's starting to grow now. Okay, So at the very end, we have strains on the order of uh, 1,000 or 1,600. Uh, those are huge strains. Those really don't make any sense. Now, keep in mind, we said that we had uh, stresses that were higher than what we defined from our stress strain curve. That's the real issue. So I go back here to my time history. And even with a with a 0.8 multiplied this, uh, but the, we also have a stress concentration factor of two and a half. Uh, you know, we really start to run into some trouble. Let's go back and look at our increments. I'm thinking around seven seconds is as much as we want to try to get to. Okay, the increments were pretty good until, yeah, uh, eight, never made eight seconds for our step time. But uh, let's kind of cut this off around seven seconds. So we're going to modify our analysis. And there's more than one way we can do this. We can leave our amplitude card the same and just take that to 7. Or we can do that and we can go into our amplitude card and we can get, get rid of everything uh, from 8, 9, and 10 downward. Or we can do both. So let's do both. All right, now that we've changed that and made that adjustment, we are going to resubmit this job and overwrite those files. And again, it'll take just a few moments. And while that's running, I'm just going to hit the pause for the video. All right, now it's completed successfully. I'm going to look at the results. I don't understand that key error. Um, I don't usually get that. I'm going to hit this, and this is my primary variable for von Mises stress. And that really looks like it's distorted. Let's um, take a look at our options, our common options, and look at our scale factor. Our deformation scale factor actually uh, is pretty small, but that might have been from the previous analysis. Let's go back and uh, let's just animate this thing and see what this is doing. This is the Von Mises stress. Let's look at our plastic strain, our PE. Okay, so now we're getting some plastic strains. And this plastic strain region is starting to grow. And I still think we're getting plastic strains that are too high. So let's take this back off and uh, let's see if we were at seven seconds. Let's back this up. take a look at six seconds and I, we're probably a little bit more reasonable at that stage let's just animate this again oh. okay. there's two seconds step through this frame uh, up to six And so we're getting strains on the order of uh, 0.17, which is uh, a really still a pretty high strain. Back this off a little bit. Okay, so about 5.7. All right, so let's redo the analysis one last time. Let's only take it up to six seconds. So I'm go back here, and I'm just going to change the step time. Six, and I'm just going to get rid of that next 
line here in this amplitude card. And even that's still a little high, but we're going to just go ahead and resubmit. Okay, while that's running, and it won't take too long, I want to talk a little bit about isotropic versus kinematic hardening. Okay. So in plasticity theory, we use uh, what's called a, a yield surface. And there's a number of different ways to think of yield surfaces, but one way is if you think of this being in what's called stress space, and it's kind of an unusual space. We can look at what's called nine-dimensional stress space. And what I mean by that is, uh, you know, we're used to three coordinates, x, y, and z, but if you can imagine having coordinates where instead of x, y, and z, we had sigma x, sigma y, sigma z, tau xy, tau xz, tau yz, tau yx, uh, tau zx, and tau zy. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. We could create a space where we have nine directions. And on this yield surface that defines the uh, point between elastic behavior inside of the yield surface and a point on the yield surface where we have plastic flow, we can talk about this surface expanding and contracting or moving. Now, <clears throat> if this surface expands, we have what's called isotropic hardening. And in a way, these surfaces correspond to different levels of plastic strain. Remember we had our stress versus plastic strain curve. And one way to even think of these is in between each of these surfaces is a different stiffness of our plastic strain. We have a different plastic tangent modulus in between these. And as these surfaces expand, then we go through different regions where we can calculate the plastic strains using that slope in between those two points. And this is basically what Abacus is doing. Now there is a disadvantage with isotropic hardening is that when this yield surface expands, it stays expanded. That means when it's gotten huge beyond its initial yield surface, that might be the, this dashed line, we have an expanded elastic range. Now this goes counter to what we observe, observe in a lot of different materials. A lot of materials have a shifted plastic range, but not necessarily an expanded plastic range. And so kinematic hardening is a movement of a yield surface where the elastic range stays the same size, but can, can shift. And, and that is also available in abacus. Now the problem with kinematic hardening in abacus, kinematic hardening by itself is known as a bilinear, is implemented as a bilinear material model. So here are my yield surfaces as they've moved through space. It's very nice for simulating elastic range that kind of approximates what we expect with the Bauschinger effect. These lines are supposed to be on top of each other here. Uh, but the problem with Abacus is that it, uh, the standard model, this is just a straight line and you only get one straight line after yielding. Now there are more sophisticated material models in Abacus. Um, and maybe we'll get a chance to talk about those later in the semester. Uh, they're, they're not easy to wrap your head around. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to stick with isotropic hardening right now. But keep in mind, if you unload, you should not unload too far. Otherwise, you won't get a good response. So using finite elements uh, is not just about understanding how the code works, 
but it's also understanding how different material models and different things and features are implemented in the code. And that may require some additional classes that you might take or some additional training. So kind of keep that in mind. All right, let's go back and take a look at our results. Now, I'm going to right click. That looks like it's done. There's our stress contour. Here's our scale factor. Let's go with a uniform scale factor of 1. Okay, so we can see what that plate would look like. Uh, here I've turned off the all edges. There's my mesh. And I'm only looking at feature edges. So we can do that. And here's our stress contour. You can kind of see that it, it kind of extends out this way. And if we look at the plastic strains, the PE, now this says the maximum end plane, we can go with the maximum principle. Or let's take a look at the PE22, which is the plastic strain in the 22 direction. Okay, we can see this shape like this. And we can animate this and make sure everything is looking like it should. And you see the time is stepping up. We might speed this up just a little bit. And you can see the, the strains are starting to appear as plastic strains uh, around five seconds in our time history or so. I want to show you a couple different options uh, for visualization. Let's go to the end of this. If we go to, uh, I always have to try to find this. If we go to ODB display options, we can create what are called mirror planes. So I can mirror that mesh in both of these planes and so I have my plate with my hole so I can even though I did a quarter symmetric model I can set this up in such a way that it looks like the entire plate I can hit OK for that and if you don't like these dark lines we can go back in here to our common options and click no edges and it'll get rid of that so uh, it's just kind of an interesting interesting way to do that. So again, these are the plastic strains. <clears throat> if we want to capture the values of the plastic strains, we can do our, our probe, and I suppose we could write down a lot of things. But let me show you how to create a chart. Down on this bottom, uh, on this button here, it says XY, create XY data. It has some different options. We're going to go from ODB field output. Remember the field are the stresses and the strains. We're going to hit continue. And it wants to know the position. I'm going to select unique nodal. And I want the strain E22 I want the plastic strain PE22 and I want the stress component S22. Now I'm going to go over to this tab and I'm going to pick from the viewport I need to click, click edit selection. I'm going to pick from the viewport. I'm going to highlight that node and I'm going to select that point right there. That's at the corner of my mesh when I had the quarter symmetric mesh. Now I'm going to hit plot. It's going to create these plots. I'm going to dismiss this window. But here it says stress and strain. Okay, and down on this bottom axis is time. So the kind of uh, pinkish color is the stress versus time. So it kind of hits a plateau. And over on the other curves are the total strain in the plastic strain. See they're the, the same maybe initially over here but then the value of the well, I guess uh, 
we always have for all time some total strain but you start ca catching some plastic strain uh, around here maybe around two seconds it looks like if I'm reading that axis right and it kind of goes up and continues on if we want to save that data we can by coming over here and taking a look at our chart this is uh, I think chart 3 you can set different chart options in here and we can do different things uh, change ticks and on titles and all that by clicking on that I'll let you explore some of that but we can also get into the data I'm going to do the XY data manager and you notice uh, there's some curve there's some of these that have under bars and some of them don't okay they should be the same data so the under bar e22 it's kind of like a temporary file for the data e22 all right, so I'm going to go and I'm going to highlight the PE, that's the plastic strain. If I click on edit, it brings up this table where we have X versus Y. Now our X was our time and our Y is our plastic strain. We can highlight these if we want and we can paste these into Excel. Now I have done that for previous analysis, so I'm going to call that up in just a second. All right, so in here is the time and total strain in the 2-2 direction. Here's time and here's stress in the 2-2 direction. And we can manipulate that. We can make plots however we want. We can sync the times up and make stress strain curves and everything. But there's something else I want to do and I want to talk about something called Neuber's Rule. So let me go back and get a, a clean page and talk about Neuber's Rule. Before we do that though, if uh, we want uh, we can save our viewport. If we go print the viewport to a file, we can select the PostScript file, an EPS file. PNG is what I usually prefer. We can save that and it will write it to our temporary directory. So this has been written to etemp graph1.png. If you hit OK, it'll override it. Uh, if we want to go back to our contour, we can do that. We can save this. Oops. We can print this, rather, as a file. Okay. And we can save our animation. So we can animate and go save as an AVI format. Here's QuickTime, here's VRML. AVI is what I usually use. You can save it as .AVI and you can specify your frames per second. Yeah, and it saves an animation. We can go back here and look at it if we want. flashed it there. Uh, there's probably some settings we need to change. Let's take a look and see what's going on with it. There's our plastic strains. So we ought to be go uh, animate, save as. Let's try this again. We'll see if the file's any larger. Okay, there it is. And it's going through the animation. Okay. All right. That's how you save an animation. All right, let's talk a little bit about Neuber's rule. Again, this is something that you'll see if you take me for a fatigue analysis class but 
Neuber was a German engineer, uh, or at least he worked in Germany. And he studied material behavior and plasticity, and he was a very fine elastician, but he also did some pioneering work in, elast in plasticity. And one of the things that he studied was the relationship between plastic strains and elastic strains at notches. And the, what's come to be known as Neuber's rule can be stated in this uh, fashion. The product of the stress and strain at a notch is equal to the nominal stress and strain times the stress concentration factor squared. Now the way this is often used in fatigue analysis is there's a constitutive relationship between stress and strain. Uh, we talk a lot about the Ramberg-Osgood equation. And it says that epsilon is equal to sigma over E, that's our elastic strain, plus a plastic strain that can be expressed as sigma over K to the 1 over N power, where K and N are material fitting constants for plastic strains and stresses. All right, again, so we would typically know the material properties, the nominal stresses and the stress concentration factor, and you can use this equation to help you solve for the stress at the notch. The stress at the notch would be then used in a fatigue analysis. But uh, what we're going to do, we're not going to go through this part of it. We're just going to see how close this works out. Sigma times epsilon at the notch, which is the elastic plastic material behavior. Let's see if it's equal to S E times KT squared, which is uh, the nominal elastic behavior. Now we're going to make an assumption that we don't have uh, uh, much plasticity and the nominal stresses and strains can be related uh, through linear elasticity. So we're going to assume that little e can be expressed as s over the modulus of elasticity. Now you might notice if we break this up as kt times s and kt times e this is the elastic notch stress and strain. So Neuber was able to show through some mathematics that even if the material yields, the product of stress and strain is the same in the elastic region and in the plastic region. All right, well, Sounds like I have a thunderstorm approaching, so I'm going to try to wrap this up. But what I've done is, uh, in this graph, I took the product of the, the nominal stress and strain times kT squared to create what I call the right-hand side. And I took these values of stress and strain uh, from the elastic plastic analysis. Now, understanding that the plasticity didn't come around until about two seconds in, uh, we do have pretty good agreement between Neuber's rule and what we just calculated up until uh, somewhere probably around four and a half seconds into the analysis. Okay, so Neuber's rule is a pretty good approximation for limited for small stresses and strains. Now what I'd like for you to do is to uh, try some more sophisticated time histories of load you can make an additional step and you can apply stresses in the horizontal direction. You can use your Excel spreadsheet and set up sinusoidal loadings. Uh, I'd like to see uh, what happens when you load and unload it and try to investigate a few different um, plots that you can create of the stress and strain behavior at what's called the root of the notch right here at this corner uh, or at, at other points of interest uh, plot the stress-strain behavior and see what you get.